Good afternoon. My name is Max Latona and I am the Executive Director of the Center for Ethics at St. Anselm College. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's event entitled Keeping Kids Out, Zoning, Housing, and Barriers to Educational Opportunity in New Hampshire. We have an exceptional group of panelists today who will be properly introduced to you in a moment by my colleague, Jason Sorens. Before he does so, I'd like to say a few very brief words about our center and our ethics and policy initiative, especially to those of you hearing about us for the first time. The Center for Ethics in Business and Governance has for its mission to address important ethical challenges in society and to do so through collaborative research, education and discussion. The core of what we do is dialogue and collaboration, in part because we think this is the most effective way for organizations and communities to get results, but also because we think that listening to and learning from one another are truly one of the most, some of the most ethical things that we can do. Uh, today's program takes place as part of the Center's Ethics and Policy Initiative, the main purpose of which is to use research, education, and discussion to bring attention to policy problems in New Hampshire's communities and to discuss possible solutions. The Ethics and Policy Initiative is made possible by those of you who support the Center, and we would especially like to thank Jason Osborne for his generous contribution. To learn more about our ongoing series of programs, I encourage you to visit our website, anselm.edu forward slash ethics. In regards to uh, the format for today's program, here is what you can expect. After Jason introduces the panelists, you will hear from each of them for no more than eight minutes each, after which there will be a 20 minute moderated panel discussion, and then uh, uh, an open question and answer session. Audience members are welcome to pose a question at any point during the event, and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, by the end of the discussion. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window and not the chat in order to enter your questions. Okay, in accordance with New Hampshire state law, I, I must inform you that we are recording this session. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jason Sorens. Uh, trained as a political scientist, uh, Jason's research has focused on fiscal federalism, US state politics, and movements for regional autonomy and independence around the world. He is a director for the Center for Ethics and will serve as moderator for today's event. Jason? Thank you very much, Max, and uh, thank you to our panelists and uh, all of you uh, who are attending this webinar. Uh, we are really interested in this topic at the Center for Ethics because um, we are interested in the issue of economic opportunity, and that has run through our Housing We Need initiative and also our Ethics and Policy initiative. Um, America used to be a land of opportunity, attracting people from all over the world uh, to better their lot and to pass on a better life uh, to their children. And while that is still substantially true, we see that much more than in the past, um, there is a problem of intergenerational economic immobility. Um, that has risen quite a bit over the past few decades, uh, as we've learned from the work of Harvard economist Raj Chetty and others. Um, so we're interested in policy solutions to this problem. And as it turns out, we came across uh, the research of uh, Brookings Institution and now a Gallup organization scholar, Jonathan Rothwell, um, who found that school districting and exclusionary zoning interact in such a way as to prevent striving families from getting their kids into good public schools. Uh, that led us to uh, decide to bring together some experts on, uh, for an event on this topic. Uh, we sought out the, the best experts we could find uh, on these related issues of school districting, uh, freezing kids into possibly um, uh, subpar or substandard schools, uh, as well as exclusionary zoning, which would then uh, impedes families' ability to get into uh, and move into those towns and localities with better schools. So those two policies seem to interact to create a problem here. And what we want to understand is this, the scope of that problem uh, and what possible solutions are. Um, now, one scholar whose work is, is relevant to this topic of keeping kids out is uh, UNH Emeritus economist Richard England, whose work we like very much. And he has looked at uh, whether 
towns benefit in terms of taxes if they keep children out of their schools. And what he has found is that that is not the case, at least not in New Hampshire these days. And I am just briefly going to share a little bit of his evidence for this. And, and I should give him all the credit for um, the data I'm about to share. Um, this is from a, uh, a study that he wrote uh, that was commissioned by the uh, New Hampshire Association of Realtors, um, looking at how school enrollments have changed over time and how that has affected property taxes. And what he finds is that actually school enrollments are declining across New Hampshire. Um, and so when you look at the cost of educating a student, you need to look not at the average cost of educating a student, uh, but at the marginal cost. So adding an additional student in your district, does that actually increase um, how much you have to spend uh, on your schools and therefore uh, how much you have to raise in property taxes? And he finds that, uh, in fact, um, the, the marginal cost of educating an additional student in New Hampshire is quite low. In the vast majority of towns, it's, it's virtually zero because enrollments have been declining. The infrastructure is there, the faculty are there, um, but as you can see from these data, um, in elementary and middle school grades, enrollments have declined just over the last decade uh, fairly noticeably. Uh, as a result, we now see a situation in which um, uh, student to teacher ratios are quite low in, in many New Hampshire towns. Um, and even more significantly, I'd like to, to point you to this uh, graph showing um, how the local tax rate has changed over time versus change in um, elementary school enrollment. And you see that towns that have had big increases in school enrollment have not had big increases in the property tax rate. And by the same token, uh, towns that have had reductions in school enrollment have not had reductions in the property tax rate. Um, so there is, first of all, a, a, a fallacy that a lot of research has identified that um, loosening up zoning regulations, allowing more multifamily housing um, is going to bring a lot of kids into schools. Um, in a lot of cases, um, the people buying multifamily housing are young couples or singles um, younger uh, households that do not have children. Um, but furthermore, there's a fallacy that even if school enrollments rise, you're going to see property taxes rise. And we don't in fact see that in New Hampshire over the last uh, decade and a half. Um, so we have a, a um, myth, I think, in, in a lot of New Hampshire communities that we need exclusionary zoning to keep property taxes low. And uh, it, it could be that the exact opposite is true. Um, and as we're going to talk about today, it could be that exclusionary zoning has all sorts of other um, unintended consequences that can lead to the problems of closing off opportunity to striving families. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to our experts now and introduce you all to them. So first, I mentioned uh, Jonathan Rothwell's research. Uh, Jonathan is principal economist for Gallup, where he researches and publishes on a broad range of social science topics and advises Gallup clients and associates on research questions and analytics, particularly in the areas of higher education, job quality, the effects of trade and technology on the labor market, and entrepreneurship. He occasionally contributes to the New York Times Upshot column and is host of the Gallup Knight Foundation podcast, Out of the Echo Chamber, about the relationship between news media and democracy. He is author of the book, A Republic of Equals, A Manifesto for a Just Society from Princeton University Press. Next, we are pleased to have Frank Edelblue. Frank Edelblue has served as Education Commissioner of New Hampshire since February, 2017. He is a businessman who started his career as a certified public accountant with a large international accounting firm. He briefly worked as chief financial officer for a public company and then started his own company, which was sold to a French firm in 2009. Edelblue continues to be active as an investor in early stage companies across a range of industries. Of course, there's no one better place to understand what the, uh, what the school choice environment looks like in New Hampshire today. Next, we have Darrell Bradford. Darrell is the executive vice president of 50 Can the 50 state campaign for achievement now, and the executive director of its New York branch, NYCAN, 
with more than 17 years working in education reform policy and advocacy. In his role, Durrell trains and recruits local leaders across the country to serve as executive directors of state CAMs, advocacy fellows, and citizen advocates. He leads the National Voices Fellowship, which focuses on education policy, media, and political collaboration, and is a member of the organization's executive team. And last but certainly not least, we have Tim DeRoche. Tim is the author of A Fine Line, How Most American Kids Are Kept Out of the Best Public Schools, which traces modern day public school attendance zones back to the racist redlining practices of the early 20th century. Having started his career at the global strategic management consulting firm, McKinsey and Company, he is an experienced executive and consultant who has served billion dollar companies leading foundations, and some of the most innovative nonprofits in K-12 education. He has written on education policy for Education Next, The Washington Post, Education Week, School Administrator, The Los Angeles Business Journal, and Colette. All right, so the way this is going to work is we're going to start out with some um, brief presentations from each of the panelists. Then we'll have a moderated q and I'll ask them questions um, maybe play a little bit of, of devil's advocate. Um, and then we will open up for audience Q&A. And uh, as Max mentioned, you are free to post your questions during the course of the event. And uh, I will moderate that Q&A at the end of the event. Um, so we're going to start off by setting up our problem. We're going to start with presentations uh, from Jonathan and Tim. Um, and then we're going to start talking about solutions and, and we'll bring in Darrell and Frank. Uh, so, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you first. Okay. Thank you very much, Jason. It's a real pleasure to, to be here with you all and have the opportunity to talk about zoning, which uh, is a topic that I've been thinking about since I was a graduate student back in 2006 to 2009. Uh, my dissertation was, was largely on zoning and its consequences. Uh, but let me start uh, by giving some perspective on you know, why we care about how zoning affects children in particular. Learning how to read and write is not something that comes naturally and automatically to humans. Literacy was rare in antiquity despite occasional flourishes in Mediterranean cities like Athens. Plato's advocacy for universal childhood education was highly unusual. For most of human history, we were entirely illiterate. It's really a fact of uh, changes in our political institutions and a commitment to mass education uh, that we have the levels of literacy that we enjoy today in uh, the United States as well as uh, around the world. And yet, uh, just as political institution institutions generate learning, illiteracy and innumeracy result from inadequacies and, inadequacies and failures. Uh, it, of our political institutions. Uh, today, there are massive gaps, as we know, in both literacy and numeracy between children from rich and poor families across uh, different racial groups with terrible consequences for our adult population and our workforce. Data from the U.S. Department of Education show that roughly half of U.S. adults lack basic proficiency uh, in, in literacy. Uh, I estimate that eradicating adult illiteracy would generate gains to GDP that would amount to roughly 10%. There are important points to consider in, 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 in figuring out what the, what the causes of, of these gaps in, in, uh, in, in learning uh, are and what, where they come from. As I discussed in detail in my book, A Republic of Equals, there's really no evidence that any part of this gap is related to the genetic endowments of different people. It really comes down to access to opportunity. And so what do we know about where learning comes from? We know that families matter and they matter in ways that, that all of us can probably recognize. Highly literate children have parents who read to them, teach them, sometimes hire tutors for them. These are practices, however, that are not rooted in unchangeable traditions. They are highly malleable. They respond to neighborhood influences and even simple text message problems, which have been found to boost reading and literacy in low-income households. 
Thus, we see that neighborhoods matter a great deal to learning and to upward mobility as uh, a large body of research has, has shown, including research uh, that Jason mentioned from uh, economists at Harvard, Ross Shetty and Nathaniel Hendren and their co-authors. Uh, likewise, peer effects, which operate at the neighborhood level are, are important. Um, and and we, we can talk about what that involves and the evidence for it and against it. Uh, but the other thing that's an obvious component of the, the advantages that certain neighborhoods bestow to children growing up in them is that neighborhoods provide access to schools. And the quality of schooling has been shown again and again through a large number of studies to have lasting and important causal effects on test scores and even on non so-called non-cognitive skills that are uh, associated with uh, being more conscientious, uh, being uh, more agreeable and, and having greater success in, in many dimensions of life. So the fact that, that neighborhoods matter and that schools matter uh, means that having a highly segregated society by race and class, as we do in the United States, is a massive problem uh, in terms of giving children equal opportunity to, to succeed, to learn and succeed, and eventually enter the workforce in a way that maximizes their ability to use the skills that, uh, that, that they possess. And some years ago, I, I looked into trying to quantify uh, some of the consequences of, of segregation when it comes to gaining access to high quality schools. And uh, what I did is, is get test score data on, on virtually every elementary school in the United States and link it to census data on housing. And I found that housing costs an average of 2.4 times as much and that amounted to, at the time, $11,000 more per year in expenses near a high scoring school that is one in the top quintile of test scores compared to a school in the bottom quintile of test scores. It, this housing cost gap reflects that home values are, at the time, $200,000 higher on average in the, in the neighborhoods of these higher scoring schools. So, one reason for this. Um, is zoning laws. And I, I did find that there was a, an empirical relationship using surveys of, of townships and local governments in terms of having larger gaps in, in, test, in test scores and also in, in housing costs in, in the areas uh, that have more aggressive anti-density zoning or treat multifamily housing as uh, an undesirable and, and illegal activity. So one of the things that I, I talk a lot about in, in my book and some other articles that I've written on this topic is that zoning originated in the early 1920s at a time when America was infected with very intense racism, to put it bluntly. And uh, zoning laws essentially treated poor people as negative externalities akin to noxious fumes or uh, disruptive noise, as if living near an apartment complex was comparable to living next to an industrial factory or, or a noisy railroad station. And it took some time for this view to gain traction. At first, zoning laws were uh, considered antithetical to the Constitution and to uh, the property rights of, of owners. A 1921 Texas court case argued that uh, zoning laws were unconstitutional largely on these grounds. I'd, I'd love to, to read a, a quote from it if we have time in the Q&A. Um, but Herbert Hoover was influential in, in leading the executive branch of the United States government to promote zoning laws uh, in the 1920s. And then in 1926, the Standard Enabling Act, uh, or that, uh, sorry, the uh, first landmark Supreme Court case uh, coming out of Euclid, Ohio, uh, ruled essentially that the, the apartment house is, uh, is 
is a negative externality that can be regulated by local governments all around the country. And zoning really took off shortly thereafter. In 1921, only 20% of the urban population in the United States lived in an area with a zoning ordinance. ordinance. That increased to 68% in 1932 and 87% in 1968. Now, at the same time, housing costs have increased dramatically since 1960. In, in 1960, a gross rent as a share of the median family income in the United States was only 17%. It went up to 23% in 1980, 27% in 2000. And in recent census data, it stands at 31%. So the, the connection between zoning and housing costs is, is well established in the economics literature for the simple reason that zoning blocks the supply of housing and forces it to areas where demand is, is lower. Uh, so I want to uh, just conclude these introductory remarks by going through a few of the, of the justifications for zoning and, and, and pointing out some of their, their problems uh, with the hope that we can discuss this a little bit further in the, in the Q&A. Some would argue that zoning is justified by protecting homeowners and their investments from changes that would undermine property values, such as exposure to what economists call negative externalities. <clears throat> And I think that there's there's some grounds for that. Uh, if if you have a home uh, and your and your neighbor decides to open an and all and maybe many of your neighbors all pull together and sell their homes to a uh, industrial manufacturer, and all of a sudden there's toxic fumes or or uh, excess loud noises. That's obviously a harm to you as a property owner. It's going to harm the value of your home. On the other hand, it's not clear how building a, an apartment complex or building townhouses that are uh, connected and slightly increasing the density of the neighborhood or the community has any negative consequences for the homeowner insofar as there are are consequences in the form of extra traffic or the need for, for more public services. Those are things that have mechanisms that, it, it, that can be dealt with other than by blocking uh, poor people from, from the market altogether, which is the choice that we've made as a country. And I would argue that it's, uh, it's one that is impossible to justify on uh, grounds on, on eth ethical grounds, and it's extremely inefficient uh, economically. It's also a, a decision that has stood us apart as a country relative to uh, Europe and, and other developed countries where this kind of discrimination against multifamily housing just isn't found according to international scholars of zoning. And so it's no surprise that we also stand out as a country in terms of having extraordinarily high levels of economic and racial segregation. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Very enlightening. Tim, you're next. All right, great. That was really helpful, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, my name is Tim DeRoche. I live uh, in Los Angeles and uh, uh, decided to write this book a few years ago. In fact, decided to research this issue long before I decided to write the book uh, based on some of the things I was seeing in, in LA, in Los Angeles, um, in my neighborhood. And uh, basically wondering, is this going on across the country? And really appreciate Jonathan's focus on the neighborhood and how, how important uh, geography is uh, the, this to, to your outcomes in life, if you live in America, you know, the, it's a, it's a trope that, that, uh, you know, your zip code determines your outcome in life. And ob obviously that's not totally true, but we all know that there's something true about that. And, 
I want to talk about one reason uh, that is true, and, and that is that where you live determines which public schools you are allowed to attend. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Can everybody see that? My map, great. So this is this is my neighborhood in Los Angeles, um, and uh, what you're seeing there, uh, these are all of the little icons are the schools in our neighborhood. We live about two miles north of downtown, pretty dense part of town called Northeast Los Angeles, near Highland Park, uh, near Eagle Rock. Um, and if, if if any of you are familiar with Los Angeles, and Basically, what you've got is you've got this red school in the middle is a very coveted school within the LA Unified School District. And uh, the red dotted line is the line that determines who is allowed to enroll in that school, right? So, so basically, uh, the district draws these lines. They do not publish the maps. The district doesn't want you to know how close you are to a higher performing school or how cl close you are to the zone for a higher performing school. But what they do publish is a school finder where you input your address and then it tells you where you're supposed to send your kid. And so what you've got is you've got these surrounding seven schools. The school in the middle, this highly sought after Mount Washington Elementary, you know, 70 to 75 percent proficiency rates uh, for grade level for the kids who go there and the surrounding schools much much lower levels of achievement so uh, no school or in the surrounding is very much above 50 percent proficient and you've got some who are down in the teens and these are all schools that share an attendance zone boundary with mount washington elementary and this overlays on the question of race in America, because what you've got is all of these surround, race and income, really, the surrounding schools are, are all uh, majority, uh, predominantly low income schools, non white, and Mount Washington Elementary is 60% white. So Mount Washington Elementary is 60% white, no, none of these surrounding schools is above 9% white, right. And so I want to point out something. Uh, Jonathan was speaking about zoning laws, zoning ordinances, um, and those. Uh, I want to just want to make the point that there are two types of zonings that we're talking about today. Two types of zone zoning, um, zoning in terms of determining which areas of the city what types of of housing are built in. Um, that's one type of zoning. What I talk about in my book. Uh, uh, are attendance zones, right? So these are the lines drawn by the school district to determine who gets in and out. Now the two overlap because if you look at the surrounding, the schools in the surrounding areas, those are areas of Northeast Los Angeles that have a high number of, uh, it's higher density housing, more multifamily uh, homes. And that's what the city has decided can, can exist in those areas of the city. The, the area within the red dotted line is majority uh, larger lots, single family homes, much less dense population. But the point I wanna make is like these things happen within th this discrimination and these outcomes, it's not just whether you live in the inner city versus whether you live in an affluent suburb. These things matter within the neighborhood. Sometimes they matter which side of the street you live on, right? So in, in areas of this map, if you live on one side of the street, you're zoned to a school where 70% of the kids are, are proficient in reading. And on the other side, you're zoned to a school where 16% of the kids are proficient in reading. It's just based on what side of the street you live on. And there is, and, and this, these are all within the bounds of the Los Angeles Unified School District. So in other words, the people who are on the outside of this red line looking in, they are paying for the schools that they are not allowed to attend. They are paying for Mount Washington Elementary through bonds, through the taxes. They are tax paying constituents of the district, but they're told, no, you can't come. Um, what I wanna point out here is that all of these other schools, these other seven schools on the map, they also have attendance zones. So they have a map associated with them. The reason we don't draw them in on the map is that their zones don't matter, right? 
L- Los Angeles Unified, like many, many places in the United States, um, uh, school districts um, it, it has way more capacity than, than students, right? And so what you have is you have a lot of empty school buildings or half empty school buildings. If you live in the, if you live in the, in the zone uh, for the blue school, that's uh, Glassell Park Elementary uh, on the left. Um, if you live in that, in that zone, you can go to the yellow school, you can go to the orange school, you can go to the purple school and they will let you in. They will let you attend, right? It is only these elite public schools uh, that uh, use the map to keep people out. Um, I do wanna point out my, my book is more than just about attendance zones. In, in different area, in, in Los Angeles, in most areas of the West and the South, there are very large districts. And so the, the, these sprawling mega districts, they carve themselves up into zones and determine who goes to which school. Um, uh, in, in the Northeast um, and, and in some other parts of the Midwest, there are usually smaller districts where the lines between districts matter more and those are more often the, the lines that are being uh, uh, keeping people out. Sometimes those lines between districts also happen within the neighborhood. You know, there are examples of, of uh, a line, a district line running straight through a neighborhood and having a failing school on one side and a, uh, uh, an elite public school on the other. So just quickly want to show you. Um, so then I started looking at the history of this. Um, and uh, some of you probably know about redlining, you've heard of redlining. So redlining was the, uh, a process um, uh, used by the federal government during the New Deal uh, to determine who was eligible for housing assistance. And they, they, there was an agency, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, that drew these maps and determined um, which areas of the city were desirable or attractive. And folks in those areas had an easy time getting housing assistance. And then the undesirable areas were, were shaded in red and yellow. That's why I refer to it as redlining. So this, this idea of using government maps to determine who is and isn't eligible for valuable government services, that is not new, right? That was used um, during the New Deal. But what you would expect and what you find is that the the areas that were determined undesirable, the places where you had a hard time getting mortgage assistance, were the areas with more uh, minorities, with more immigrants, right? So it was basically a way to ensure that government assistance went to the politically powerful. And so what I started wondering uh, in the middle of writing this book was, well, these these policies are analogous. is there any pattern there? Do, do, the, do the patterns persist over the generations, right? So here you can see the same, you'll say the same weird shape um, of the uh, zone for Mount Washington Elementary School overlaid on the redlining map from the 1930s. And what you can see is that the zone captures most of the blue area, the quote unquote best area um, the desirable area from that 30s, 1930s map. And uh, it excludes uh, the red and yellow areas that had higher proportions of uh, minorities and immigrants. So just very, very troubling policies that persist through the generations and demographic patterns of neighborhoods that persist through the generations. Um, I, we did a little bit of research into each of the state's laws and uh, I know there's a New Hampshire law, for example, that, that, that empowers the local school district to declare any single school within the district an open enrollment school, right? Um, I think what I would like to ask is, why do we need a law like that, right? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't the definition of a pub- public school be that it is open enrollment, right? If you are excluding folks based on where they live, then it is not truly a public school. And, and I would argue that many of these elite schools, um, both these ones with attendance zones and then also ones uh, behind district boundaries, 
I would argue that they are operating as quasi private schools funded by the taxpayers for the politically powerful and the wealthy, not, not the super wealthy. These are, these are folks in the upper middle class usually, but uh, I do think these are quasi private schools and we should, we should be working to open them up in, in a number of different ways. Thank you very much, Tim. Darrell. Uh, <clears throat> so whatever I have to say, it's not gonna take eight minutes, I promise. Um, I wanna thank uh, St. Anselm uh, and the Center for Ethics for inviting me here today. I also wanna thank Commissioner Edelblue. I wanna make sure I got that right, thank you. Uh, Edelblue for taking time out of what I'm sure is his very busy schedule to be here with us today to talk about this. Um, incredibly important issue. I will just hat tip now. It's important to me too because I grew up in one of those, um, one of the areas that Chetty's work says it is hardest to go from the bottom income quintile to the top income quintile. So I, uh, I feel like a lot of what um, has been discussed, uh, I sort of like lived it. So um, so I have like a slightly different take on it. Um, but I but I also want to be hopeful about how we can navigate it together. So everybody before me has already talked about this. Um, we have a system of education that bundles your house and your school, and that system has problems, and it's problematic, uh, and it has problematic roots, because despite all of the good, uh, despite all of the good that it's done, um, but there have been, let's say, some unintended consequences, and we've heard a little bit about them, but not all of them, uh, and we should be honest about those two. So, uh, so one, obviously, like, people in America live together with people that are like them. And one, and one of the results of that and laying school zoning on top of that is that our public schools are more segregated now than they were before Brown v. Board. Um, there is, you know, maybe not in New Hampshire, but in many other states now, a quiet um, sort of like a rise of what, what we call municipal secession, which is where, you know, one district is sort of, well, there's a district and there's a wealthy part of a district and, there's a, and then there's the rest of the district that is less wealthy and the wealthy part of the district carves itself out and makes its own district and sort of takes its own um, uh, property, property wealth with it, which obviously has a very deleterious effect on everybody. And then there's sort of just like a hyper localism about all of this that particularly if you are a commissioner of a state and have a statewide view and want to and are interested in the performance and improvement of all kids makes it more difficult to have like systemic conversations about how all kids have have and achieve opportunity in, uh, in, in public education in a state and in America. And then there are two other things we sort of touched on them too. You know, education is not supposed to be a market, but it is actually turned into two of them, and neither of them are healthy. And the first one, it's it's obviously the housing market, and that has uh, incredibly you know sort of frustrating uh, economic impacts on young families, new families who have to buy into overheated house housing markets to get school that is supposed to be free. Like here I am, like I'm. Uh, whenever I get to do a panel, I'm the person who tells you things you already know, but just like asserts them with authority. Uh, and I think a lot of the time we, we leave young families out of the discussion because the, there are other issues about zoning and about school assignment and about your address being your ticket to the school that you want that, um, that are also really important and they grab the mind more like race and how race plays in all these, all these policies. But we can't leave the economic impacts out for young families in particular, it's very important. Um, and the other one is that we just develop this black market for education that is fueled by people who are willing to lie um, about their addresses to get school, to get entrance into better performing schools in towns where they may not live. Now it's easy to look at the, how, at the history of redlining or residential assignment and hang the blame on someone. On the one hand, I can't think of a state that actually guarantees a right to a neighborhood school that you get access to based on where you live, but we have built a system that confers that understanding to people. And as Tim uh, you know, uh, also uh, often says, I've been doing this roadshow a little bit with Tim lately, that understanding distorts everyone's behavior. Um, most importantly, it creates a what is what's mine is mine orientation toward how people access schools. And that invariably comes with the perceived good guys and bad guys. And, and that is also zero sum. And none of that is helpful. 
Um, this also ignores that the bet on a house to get a school that's supposed to be free also doesn't always work for the person making the bet. Sometimes you buy a house because your kid, uh, because when your kid isn't even born and you're hoping that you get the right school that matches only to find out years and hundreds of thousands of dollars later that that isn't the case. And there's also the simple fact that all kids are different and what works for one kid may not work for another even when they live in the same house. Options benefit everyone. Now, I've, uh, I've probably signaled this already. I'm a school choice advocate, and I think choice is a necessary precondition to unwinding much of what we've discussed today in a way that's productive, because I think the right to choose is both fundamental and fundamentally American. I think freedom is essential, and I think it's what unites us as a people. I also support school choice because the only school I ever went to, as I mentioned earlier, that I was zoned for was the first one. And, uh, and too often I've been in rooms where I ask people about whether they or someone they know has lied about their address to get into a school they weren't zoned for and the majority of the, hand, the hands go up. Uh, and that happens in rooms with elected officials, just like it happens in rooms with moms and dads who are trying to do uh, what's, what's best for their kids. Um, this isn't how it is supposed to be. So when you add all these things up, in my mind, there's never been a better time to revisit these covenants and their restrictions, the lines they employ that keep us apart, and the mindset they reinforce that emphasizes scarcity, limits the free movement and association of students and families, and asserts tremendous economic pressure on all of us, even as it limits the dynamism necessary to help us improve education for all kids in New Hampshire and elsewhere. This seems both ironic and more true than ever, given the fact that millions of American students have not set foot in a school building for over a year in places, but somehow still wind up on Zooms zoned to the schools they cannot physically attend. Uh, we're all trapped in this old paradigm where address is destiny, and there's no time to break out of that uh, like now. And I look forward to uh, discussing it with everybody later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darrell. Frank. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen as well. And uh, so I just so appreciate that. Is that coming across? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I so appreciate the, uh, the invitation. Thank you, St. A's, um, for inviting me. Um, I sort of feel like I'm a little bit outside of my uh, space here with some experts who've been studying these topics for a really, really long time. Um, so I, I don't necessarily uh, want to make sure that everybody knows I'm not an expert on zoning laws and, uh, and the direct impact on educational outcomes. I do know something about um, student learning. I know something about uh, measuring learning and achievement gaps. Um, and so hopefully, uh, you know, some of that will come through um, in the conversation. I look forward really to some robust conversation about it. Um, probably stating the obvious here, but, you know, I think there's universal agreement in terms of the performance gaps. Um, I think we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, that these gaps are real because uh, sometimes people want to pretend that they're somehow they're not real. They're growing. Um, we see that here in New Hampshire. We see it across the country in our NAEP scores across the country. Uh, the, it's getting worse and it's, and it's persistent. Um, it's interesting, I wanna talk a little bit today. I, I read some of the research that was shared with me. Uh, I didn't know I was gonna be on a panel with Jonathan. I read his paper on this thing. So Jonathan, thank you for letting, sharing that with me. Um, and I have some thoughts about that. Uh, but I think it leaves out, some of, the, some of the research I think leaves out some historical artifacts that might prover, provide context to some of what we're talking about. Um, and I think that we all recognize that you have to be really careful. Um, you know, the correlation causation confusion that can potentially take place uh, when you're looking at something like this, uh, because this is really a very highly complex uh, multivariable equation that we've got going here. Um, as Daryl points out, kids are all different. Guess what? They're human. And as humans, we're all unique. And that means that we're gonna approach and access our education in different ways. Um, and also, if this was an easy and simplistic problem, um, it would have been solved already. Like people have been working on this for 40 years plus, maybe longer, um, and they have not come up with that magic bullet. And I only know that I've been looking for that magic bullet. And if anybody uh, finds it, please let me know what that is. Um, 
it's interesting when we talk about, uh, you know, kind of when I'm reading the research on this, um, you know, the proxy that they use for success or not success is really kind of these assessment scores. Um, and we basically point out, and these are New Hampshire scores, we've got an average English large proficiency of 60%. My friend reduced kids are attaining about 40%. Um, and that's consistent for my minority populations as well. My math, uh, you know, my average in the state is 49%. My free and reduced population is at 29%. Um, so I just, I raised that as a question, is this really a good proxy if we're only getting, you know, half of the kids to the goal at, to begin with? Maybe we're just asking ourselves the wrong question in terms of what is it that we're after here? Um, you know, what is, how, how are we trying to move these students forward? Um, it was interesting as I was reading Jonathan's paper, I took the advantage of reading some of his footnotes. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, the most compelling uh, of the articles that was in the footnotes was this uh, logic model that was put forth by Hastings and Weinstein about information, school choice, academic achievement. And essentially, as I read that research paper, um, it talked about where there are good choices you know, so when given a good choice, so that presumes a choice, uh, it's a Tim's model, there's a lot of schools around there where you're gonna end up. So when given a good, when given a choice, parents and caregivers will choose an educational setting with a higher attainment, right? So parents are capable, caregivers are capable of making uh, effective choices is what I read when I read that there. Um, the second thing that in this logic model that they uh, supported was that attending schools with higher attainment results in increased attain, increased achievement for those students who are going there. And so ipso facto, my, you know, A equals B, B equals, uh, you know, uh, C, so therefore A equals C, choice benefits achievement for otherwise disadvantaged children. Um, and so I guess I asked the question, you know, is the educational, is it the educational setting here or is there some type of an engaged family dynamic that's taking place? Right, like what came first in this process, allowing those children to go to that uh, school that's higher performing, or the fact that you had parents who had agency and the opportunity to make a choice, um, as opposed to many of our current policies, which are drawn by uh, zip codes. Or in New Hampshire, Tim, we don't we don't have a ton of uh, larger districts. It's mostly by towns, right? And truthfully, you know, seventy percent of the cost of that school system is paid by the the taxpayers in that town, right? So this breeds a little bit of that kind of idea that this is my town, like, and I'm paying for my school and not the school in the town next door to that. So um, not necessarily arbitrarily drawn lines in a, in a more rural state like in New Hampshire, um, but based on the towns. Um, and so I really, uh, you know, as I kind of look at this, I think one of the, one of the quotes out of some of the, the work that we read there is, that parents are willing to pay more to live near high scoring schools. And so again, is it the school or is it the parent? Is it the agency? Um, and interestingly, and in, uh, with the, many of the researchers who are on this call, they can do this. I've done some simple analysis associated with this, but I have very low correlation between my spending in an, on an educational setting and my achievement for my free and reduced students. Uh, we're talking about an R squared factor of like 0 0.03. So, very little correlation between uh, that high performing districts that maybe is spending more and uh, my free and reduced kids. I've seen some data, I wasn't able to put my hands on it for this, that would illustrate that my free and reduced students in a poverty district um, perform better than my free and reduced students in a more wealthy district. Um, and I'm not sure what that, what would be the driver of that. Um, but again, in the short time that I have with you, here's just some uh, historical artifact that I want to bring up that it, I think it might reflect on this whole conversation. Um, this is a quote from Thomas Sowell, which is really talking about back in the 40s, before the expansion of the welfare state and the ideology of victimhood used to justify it, that there was no such gap in test scores between black schools in Harlem and white working class schools on the Lower, lower East Side. Um, I'm sure that some of the experts on here would be able to weigh in on that more. But one of the examples examples, I was going to say exemplar, but it might be an exemplar as well, is really I want to talk just a little bit about the Rosenwald schools, right? So these are schools, it was this partnership between Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald. Um, it was, they built 5,000 schools for Black families. So they were segregated families at a period 
of Jim Crow and segregation was all around us. Um, when they launched the proposal, this was seed money that started up some of these schools, uh, but it required a significant amount of community investment. And that investment wasn't necessarily financial so much as community engagement in the process of uh, you know, starting up that school. Uh, those Rosenwald schools, um, according to the Chicago Federal Reserve, uh, you know, basically the, the initiative started, but it resulted in significant reductions. Um, you know, they're saying a stunning 40% narrowing of the racial education gap that was taking place at that time. And this is a time when, there, again, there was segregation. There were two sides to the railroad tracks. Um, there were schools that were built out of the way. And so I wonder, here's, you know, is this a, an alternative um, look at, uh, you know, zoning and geography and where somebody lives. And so, um, so while this was a victory for racial justice and equality, you know, um, it was the beginning of the end uh, for thousands of the Rosenwald schools when we actually got ourselves Brown uh, v. Board of Ed and the Civil Rights Act because essentially all of a sudden now we started to assign everybody on zip codes. We started to assign folks based on uh, where they were living and we took away some agency from communities that uh, otherwise maybe had a need to, to represent those agencies. And so here is um, just a historical artifact to put into this conversation to mix it up because I knew I might not otherwise have anything to bring with all these experts that I'm dealing with. So thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, we are now going to uh, move to a, a panel discussion. I see we've got a, a, quite a few good questions in the Q&A, so I'm, I'm not going to, to hog all the questions here. Uh, we have actually a number of, I see, uh, state legislators who are posing questions and scholars, so, um, so I do wanna get to those. Um, but I do have uh, a few questions here to kind of elaborate on, uh, on what we've, we've talked about so far. Um, and maybe even uh, play a little bit of devil's advocate just to, um, to push this a little bit. Um, so first of all, I want to, um, I want to make this uh, a little more relevant to New Hampshire. Um, so Jonathan, your work um, has been on places like the, the Boston metro area. That's one of the cases you've looked at, uh, which does spill over the border into New Hampshire. So do we, do we have, um, these problems with exclusionary zoning in New Hampshire, especially in, in our suburbs in the southern third of the state where most of the population lives. Um, and, and what does that look like? So do we have that problem? What does that look like specifically? Is it just bans on multifamily housing or are there other zoning policies at work there? So I don't have great data on New Hampshire specifically, but I did come across a very thorough database of most townships and local governments in Massachusetts. And my, my general impression is that the Northeast has very similar zoning laws and similar forms of, of government organization at, at the local level in terms of empowering local governments to dictate how land is used. And we see all around the country that zoning laws tend to follow the same pattern. And, and that pattern was established in, in the 1920s through the, the Zoning Enabling Act that Herbert Hoover and his, his partners pushed through. And, and the, the basic problem is this discrimination against housing density. Now that can take a variety of forms. One is, is just to prohibit high density housing altogether in, in the township or in the local government jurisdiction. And that certainly happens. And we've got good data uh, from this Massachusetts survey that it's, that's fairly common in, in Massachusetts. Uh, but then there are, there are also important zoning laws that, that segment certain parts of the municipality for higher versus lower density housing. And, and that can be just as problematic if, especially if, if as, as you know, Tim has emphasized, all the good schools tend to be in the areas that uh, are zoned only for large lot, single family homes. Uh, and, and just to elaborate a little bit more on some of the mechanisms, lot size is, is, is another one. So you may, 
not discriminate explicitly based on the on whether it's a multifamily housing or, or whether it's single family housing, but you might say it has to sit on a, a, a large lot. And, and so it, it, it becomes uh, prohibitive to, uh, and, and then there's also laws about the ratio between the, the height of the home and the lot size and all, all these other ways. But the, the net effect is, is basically to keep a lid on high density housing. And, and all the data I've seen suggests this is a major problem throughout the Northeast, including in New Hampshire. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so open enrollment uh, policies have, have come up. A few states have actually have state level requirements that districts allow open enrollment. So parents can choose uh, which public school to send their kids to. And, um, and usually, um, you know, there'll be a process whereby that um, school of choice gets money to educate that child. Um, New Hampshire does not have a requirement uh, for open enrollment policies. Uh, what do you guys um, think of such policies? Um, or is that a, a potential solution here? Um, what, are, what are some things to think about if policymakers want to implement an, an open enrollment policy? Uh, I was going to let the commissioner go first, but since I went to school in New Hampshire for a year, I will do so. Um, so like, like almost every public, so I, I favor uh, open enrollment, public school open enrollment as a policy the state, that a state can adopt. I think the important question is, what does the state want to get out of open enrollment policy? So there are some places that have, um, like Arizona, that has open enrollment because open enrollment is a, a, a choice state and the bulk of open enrollment is actually between public school districts there. Um, there are states like uh, New Jersey that has um, public school open enrollment um, funded out of a line item in the budget annually, which basically means there's a cap on it, which is not optimal, um, that was supposed to offer greater opportunity to sort of low income kids who were zoned to chronically underperforming schools for the most part, but instead is a program where kids who are like kind of in better performing districts go to other districts for programs that they like, which is also like a, a laudable end, but that wasn't exactly why they they passed the, uh, why, why we passed the law, you know, and, and Ohio sort of reflects back that same, um, that same challenge, which is that it's like, hey, we have open enrollment, but there's no school near, you know, like um, a major urban area that has any seats available. So, so the further away you are from the urban area, the more likely you are to have uh, have seats available. I would just say, because I'm like looking at some of the, some of the chatter in in the chat, I do think it is also worth considering that like all of these discussions, right, are proxy for discussions as well for how your state finance mechanism works, right, or, or how those things interact with one another. Do you want a state finance system that prioritizes location, or do you want one that whose highest value is the, the matching of students with an environment that is best for them, right, where, where you know, whether it's for program or for expectations or for people uh, sort of in a roundabout way to, uh, to the commissioner's um, comments of earlier. So Daryl, I'm just gonna weigh in a little bit on that as well. I mean, uh, cause I agree with that. And I was gonna even just start out with that last point that you made that a, con a discussion about open enrollment not, needs to start with the precursor of what are we funding? Are we funding a school system? Or are we funding students in their education? Um, and as you know, and that's a difficult shift for individuals to make, right? Um, and the, the thing about education, everyone's an expert because everyone went to school at some point or another. Um, but the question is, are we supposed to be funding an institution or are we supposed to be funding students to the best possible outcome that we can get to? And if you can get through that conversation, I think once you break through that conversation, then the open enrollment becomes a much easier conversation to have. Yeah, I think I think this harkens back to uh, what you, you were talking about, Commissioner Edelblut, about the, the ability of parents to be engaged and to make good decisions for their children. I think of open enrollment and other reforms as a way to battle something, um, a problem that we have with our society, which is a complacency of parents around about the schools they choose for their children. And, and I actually believe that complacency stretches up and down the uh, income spectrum and crosses racial boundaries. 
Um, you know, you see it in the in in some of my peers here in, in in LA who are like they're just all about the great schools number, right? They're just they're, they're you know I'm going to buy a home wherever that's that number is the highest because uh, we're in competition to get the highest number on great schools. I you know if you look at the NCES statistics, they add, they do a parent survey. Over 50% of parents just passively send their kids to whatever school they are zoned to based on where they live. Now, there's a smaller portion that uh, uh, choose private schools or homeschool. There are a smaller portion that purchase a home specifically, right? That, that's actually a minority. That it's a minority of parents who choose where to live based on the school. But there, there, there are people who say they do that. As Darrell pointed out, there are also, and, and NCES does not ask about this, there are people who lie about their schools. And I'm with Darrell, like you would not believe like in talking to people about this at dinner parties and, and gatherings um, and, and cocktail parties over the past five years, everyone knows somebody who's, who's lied about their average. Everybody has a story about that. Um, it is a part of the American experience um, and it is up and down, up and down the economic spectrum. Right? I talked to a, a, a wealthy Malibu mom, grandmother, who when her daughter was going to school, she wanted her kid in Santa Monica High and they didn't live in Santa Monica. They paid their neighbor for their gas bill, right? They paid their neighbor for the gas bill, took it to the school, got their daughter into the public school they thought was right. And those, those, that was in the, one of the wealthiest parts of Los Angeles. And so I, I just think we're combating by, by, by encouraging open enrollment, by encouraging um, uh, the funding of students, right? Um, I think we, we've been in the habit of funding systems by encouraging the funding of students and empowering the parents. We're combating uh, a complacency that has grown up around, around what school you send your kid to um, that I don't think is healthy for, for any of us. So let's uh, move the conversation to private school uh, choice programs. Um, what's the, the research out there on that? This is, this is under active consideration in, uh, in New Hampshire, an educational freedom accounts bill uh, just passed the, the Senate. Um, what does the research show? Uh, do private school choice programs have an impact on achievement gaps or other outcomes? I'm just going to jump in because I've been working on this for a bit and, and I'll short, you know, make a real short answer. But I mean, if you look at the research in terms of student outcomes, you know, 17 studies on student outcomes, you know, 11 positive, four neutral, the rest negative, but preponderance positive, given the fact that generally these programs attract at risk or higher to educate or more difficult to educate types of students. Um, in terms of the public school systems with private schools choice systems, 27 studies, 25 of whom which show that by creating some type of a choice program, which includes private schools, the public schools in those geographic areas also improve. The tide comes up and everybody's boat's going up. And then 55 studies on the effect for taxpayers, um, you know, 49 of them show positive benefits to the taxpayers in those communities. The next time I have to answer that question, can I call you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sound, that answer maybe sounded definitive according to the other. What, and, yeah, and I, I think I, I, what, the only thing I would add there is I think there's a lot of advantages to empowering parents to, to choose what's right for their kids. I think also this disaggregation of schooling, what I, what I love about educational savings accounts as opposed to prior reforms, is they allow you to spend money with different providers, right? Like, I want my kid to get Spanish tutoring from this person, right? I want them to uh, go to this after school program. And instead of saying, oh, I've got one check and it goes to one provider, this, this idea of uh, flexible spending accounts for education, it maps to things that have worked well in other sectors like healthcare, right? Healthcare savings accounts, flex flexible spending accounts. And it's, uh, it, it empowers the consumer rather than, um, uh, uh, rather than, uh, than the system. And it allows you to disaggregate your spending uh, to maximize the, you know, to get what's right for your kids. And I, I would just say real quick, real quick on this. So a lot of the time people 
look at the, the question of having a good private school choice program as, as one that is oppositional. To me, it, again, it should seem obvious, right? Like not every school is the right fit for every, every child. And in any place, like why wouldn't you want to consider all of the educational uh, sort of institutions that you have available to be at your disposal, right? So they can, so you can solve a whole different bunch, like a whole bunch of different uh, educational challenges and, and problems. I, I, I don't like, my, my position on school reopening is very sophisticated, at least I think it is. But, you know, there are lots of places where, where people are working really hard to get back in schools and those schools are not open and local private schools are open showing that it can be done, right? And so, so obviously there is a, a role that, um, uh, uh, that a good mix of schools, public, private and otherwise plays in a, a, a robust sort of um, educational environment for a, a town or a state. And I think we should support that. All right, running low on time. This might end up being my last question for all of you, but um, devil's advocate time. Um, so to what extent is exclusion necessary for quality public schools? I mean, it may not be politically correct, but I'm sure there are people out there who think things like, letting poor families live in my town uh, is going to make my schools worse. Uh, what do you say to that? So I, uh, I'd like to speak to that uh, from a variety of perspectives. Uh, first, as a, a parent whose children go to diverse public schools, I don't feel like they're harmed by having a having peers that come from poor families and from different racial backgrounds. To me, the, uh, the appropriate response there is not to force those children to be segregated by themselves, uh, but to think of solutions that uh, are, are, are meaningful and affordable. And so there, there are fortunately many out there and they could be enacted at the city level, they could be acted at the school district level, they could be acted by the PTA at the school level. They range from things like access to universal pre-K, which erases some of the, the gaps in kindergarten test scores and, and readiness for, for the rest of uh, the educational trajectory. They, that's obviously on one of the more expensive sides. There's, there's cheaper programs like uh, nurse family partnership program, which through randomized controlled trials has been found to boost test scores in early childhood by simply having nurses come in to uh, low income mothers at, to the homes of low income mothers and provide advice on diet, nutrition, health, and um, cognitively stimulating activities they could be doing with their children. Uh, from infancy. Then at the school level, there are programs uh, that have been enacted that are as simple as sending text messages to parents and, and to remind them to read to their children and giving them books. Uh, Dolly Parton famously created a program that gives books to every kid in certain school districts. DC uh, residents benefit from that. We, at, uh, from a very early age up until I think age four, Every child born in the District of Columbia sent a book on a regular basis, uh, and 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 that's been found through randomized controlled trials to boost test scores. And then there, there's uh, of course hiring teaching assistants uh, and and providing tutoring services. High dosage tutoring has been found through through experimental evidence from Roland that Roland Fryer has documented to have a major effect on test scores. So we have a lot of tools out there to, to, to lower gaps within schools. And it's, uh, it's just not, to me, an acceptable approach to say that the, you know, we're, we're just going to segregate uh, rich kids together and, and that your goal as a parent should be to get your kid uh, surrounded by the richest people and most high achieving people they can and, uh, and, 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 and essentially forget about everyone else. Yeah, I, I, would, I know you play a devil, devil's advocate, but I, I would just say that, 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 that the fear that lives in that question is the product of 100 years of education policy built on scarcity, right? 
And, uh, and so on the, on the one hand, it is like reprehensible. On the other hand, it is absolutely understandable. And that's why we have to unwind it, right? With, with, with respect to all the interventions that uh, Jonathan talked about, we, we assign people to schools in a way that makes people feel like I, I have to protect what is mine at all costs, right? And that has um, tremendous friction on how we interact with one another as Americans. And, and that is the problem. That is the problem. All right, thank you. I, I think uh, we should move to some of the attendee questions now. I, I wish I could uh, uh, keep going with this, but uh, I need to share the, share the spotlight here. So <laughs> I'd like to start off um, with a question from Susan Humala, and maybe this uh, needs to go to you, Frank. Uh, does New Hampshire share the same attendance zone issues like LA does? Does this occur in Manchester, Nashua, or Concord? which um, are all cities that have multiple schools within the same district. So I'm, I'm curious about this as well. So there are districts. So in Manchester, we've got, I think it's 13 elementary schools. We've got our two middle schools and we've got three high schools. Um, I would tell you that um, I don't know the answer to that question. I think I saw Tim's thing and I was thinking of Manchester and wanting to draw those little lines myself. Um, I suspect that it probably the same phenomena you find in LA is probably exists in some of our urban areas as well, but I don't know the answer to them. Okay, thanks, Frank. Um, here's a question from um, Mike Mathias, who's a professor here at St. A's. Um, he, he says, uh, in my town, many are arguing against multifamily development because of a perceived impact on our schools and increased property tax load relative to new tenants. How would you argue in a town meeting setting that multifamily housing development is a good idea for existing homeowners? Assume we are right at the limit of elementary school enrollment. Um, so a couple of things to unpack there. One of it is like the zoning issue. How do you uh, argue for that? But the, the other one, maybe there's, maybe there's something creative here that can be done on the education side where it comes to um, the, the enrollment issue. But throwing that out there, what, what do you guys think about that? Well, I, I think the list of interventions I went through are relevant for thinking about how to how to deal with the potential fallout from having children who are struggling in, in a school that is otherwise not used to dealing with low income children or children who are learning English as a second language. Uh, those things do, I would say, though, maybe in contrast to, to, to your point, Jason, that that those things cost money and somebody's got to pay for them, the the the, the state should have money available for that because ultimately what you want to do is avoid a race to the bottom where uh, each municipality puts up barriers that make it impossible for poor people to live in their municipality. And, and, and from the state's perspective, it's more expensive to have, to have poor people concentrated in low income segregated neighborhoods. It's much better to have them integrated uh, and, and any, any problem you, you stereotypically attribute to, to poor people all but disappears when, uh, when they grow up in integrated neighborhoods and wouldn't have access to high quality public services. So the state arguably should be funding uh, that and not putting those, those additional costs on, on, or at least entirely on local governments, in my opinion. And I, I think I think there's also just an appeal to openness and freedom and neighborliness, right? Those are American traditions in their own way. And there are certainly times when um, housing decisions and influxes of new population, a new population of folks, can change uh, a neighborhood and can disrupt some of the things that that we might like about a neighborhood. I would argue one. That's just life, right? Like, like things change. We 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 aren't allowed to protect uh, the things we love forever if it means restricting the freedom of others. Um, I would also argue that um, these kinds of fears get called up much more frequently than the actual problems that arise, right? So so I I think there are some genuine circumstances where you know you do want to protect. Uh, the character of a community, but I and and want to um, you don't want to you don't want to uh, necessarily 
change things overnight or allow things to change overnight. But I think these kinds of issues get called up oftentimes when there are changes going on at the margin, right? That that aren't really going to impact the character of the community and 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 I think appeals to uh, values of openness and freedom um, and neighborliness can 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 work. I just add so we, one quick one quick thing that one of the strongest findings from social science is that when people spend time with one another and they get to know one another, they trust one another, and the stereotypes they have of one another tend to erode. So we have some uh, reactions here that are uh, pretty skeptical of school choice. I'm going to group a couple of these together uh, to see what your reactions are. So from Lois Coat. Why increase choice instead of assuring all public schools are quality schools? It sounds unethical that every child getting a good education require a competition to assure freedom of choice, meaning there isn't deliberately a true availability of a good education for all children. And then uh, Diana Terrell says that I find the manner in which we're describing quality schooling here deeply problematic. If a quality school is one where the literacy proficiency rate is higher and kids who are in wealthy families have higher literacy rates before they even enter the public school system at five years old, aren't we just saying to create more access to quality schools, kids of color and free and reduced lunch kids just need to be closer to wealthier families and maybe have their parents read to them at night before bed? Is this realistic? And she also said that No Child Left Behind showed that um, parents with kids in failing schools won't exercise choice when given the, the option. Um, so, okay, what are some reactions to those? I want Daryl to weigh in us because I want to see what he has to say, but I'm, I'm just going to jump in there because I recognize one of the, um, the questioners uh, who is working in a higher education institution in New Hampshire. Um, and so I guess what I would ask is maybe we should assign people to colleges and universities based on their zip codes rather than students choosing an education pathway that meets and fits their needs as an option. So I, I realize I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but that's kind of what you know, we're advocating for here. And nothing happens when a child you know, turns from 18 to 19, all of a sudden their educational needs are not completely transformed. Right? Those same qualities that allow students to find pathways in post-secondary apply in secondary and they apply in our elementary school system as well. Yeah, Commissioner, that uh, I'd love to roadshow with you. That was a great setup, sir. Um, so I, I just want to uh, sort of flip the, the question on its head. Uh, it's not a question of whether or not we're going to have school choice. It's for whom we're going to have it. Uh, because right now we have a school choice system. If you make enough money, you buy the right house, you move to the school, you, you go to the school that you want and you get it or you pay for tuition and you go. The, the, the challenge is that if you don't make enough money to be able to do those things, you don't participate in the same school choice system and someone else decides for you. So I, I always think that's um, uh, really important to think about. Back to the, the NCLB question, I think is actually um, a really good one. Um, and I don't, I don't wanna be flipped like, you know, I'm on the board of a, a, a charter school network with 20,000 kids and the majority of them are, are black and brown and their parents love to read to them. Um, but I think one of the things that NCLB highlighted was that um, we could, like, you could, you could have AYP and you could trigger an option for people, but we triggered them into places with few options. Um, and so, like most, uh, uh, most sort of like underperforming school systems, because that was what NCLB was about. What, you know, they were filled with schools that, that hadn't met adequate yearly progress. So even if you wanted to get out, it was you and, and 100,000 other people who wanted to get out. And when you know that the choice is not real, and in that case, because there's no supply there, it's not real, people behave differently. And they're just like, yeah, I'll just sort of ride this out uh, uh, on my own. So those are my thoughts on those two things. Yeah, I've, I've got... I, I've heard this objection a lot, you know, um, this idea, why don't we just make all schools better? And I think that is a fundamental misreading of the human animal. Um, the, there will always be schools that are sought after. There will always be schools, because schooling is so tied to the outcomes of your family, because it's also tied to social status, there is a, an element of fashionability about where we want to send our kids as a community, right? And I, I actually try to resist those, those things, but it's hard to do, even as, a, even as someone who believes that those things deserve to be resisted. Um, the, 
the, if you look in my neighborhood, you know, the people who are about equality of opportunity, those are the people who are most competitive, who are most desperate to get their kids into the elite school, right? So I, I you know, the, the, the French philosopher René Girard says that, that human desire is mimetic, right? We want what other people want. And if, if we are going to have schools that have more demand than seats, then as a democracy, as a, as a society, we need a method of allocating those seats to, to, you know, to some of those people and not to others. And the, to do it based on where you live, which is totally dependent on your wealth, is completely backwards and completely antithetical to the idea that public education is the great equalizer. It does, it, it's, it's the exact, it, it's functioning in the exact opposite way to the way it was the mission stated for the system in the first place. And, and, the, and I, let me just tell you, the people in my neighborhood who have BLM signs in their front yard are the ones who are the most desperate to avoid sending their kids to these schools that have large populations of low income kids. So I just don't think, I think we're in a world um, where we're always gonna have that problem and we need solutions as a society that allocate those fairly. If they are true public resources and not quasi private, then we need a way to allocate those uh, fairly um, to our citizens. Uh, just yeah, before I know we're short on time, but a few points I'd like to make. I do think, I'm very sympathetic to, to choice and I, I, any policy that allows poor kids to escape terrible schooling situations or terrible neighborhood situations and get something better is something that I'd support. Um, but I do think that most people will end up going to their neighborhood school or a school that's in their neighborhood. And because there's, there is, the data does suggest that proximity is something that people value, right? So. If we're going to have choice, we also have to build more schools or get charter schools next to the traditional public school. And, and if it's working better, start moving more kids to that one and shut down the, the school that is failing. I, I, at the same time, I, I also don't think we need to, I think we can move forward with offering families that have bad choices now or no choice and only one bad choice. We can, we can, we can resolve that problem. At the same time, we are trying to make all schools better. And I, you know, when I think about some of the reasons that the all schools better uh, task seems so daunting, one is that we don't currently pay teachers based on performance. Management theory 101 says that if you want people to do better at their job, pay them if they perform better. That, that gets people who uh, who are more engaged and excited about the work to, to, to both enter the field and stay in the field. And it encouraged the right set of behaviors once they're in the field. And for some reason, we don't do that when it comes to, to teaching. We do it for, for just about everything else that we care about as a, as a society, but something as important as teaching, we, we, we pay only based on seniority in, in most public schools. And so I think that is just one reform that I would like to see um, in addition to expanding choices. Great. Uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. One, one last question, because we have a couple of questions here that are asking about the logistics of open enrollment, if we allowed that. Um, so, so Bill Fischel has a question for Tim. If LA Unified eliminated zone lines around Mount Washington Elementary, how would you allocate spaces in the classroom? And would you expect the school to be as successful without the zone? Uh, and then um, Jacqueline Ahern uh, asks, how would the panelists who are proponents of open enrollment handle transportation? Isn't it going to be difficult for families in a lower income bracket to actually get their children to a school that is not close to them? Uh, so that is that kind of relates to, to something Jonathan was just saying. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think um, I advocate for lotteries, right? The, the, almost all of the states, when they pass their charter school laws, required lotteries when the school is oversubscribed. And the reason they did that is they didn't want the schools, the, this publicly funded school, this publicly funded charter school, to be able to cherry pick their students 
um, you know, because it's a this is a public good. And and I would just argue that I think the those those lotteries are not perfect. They can be gamed, but at least they start with the principle of equal opportunity. And 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 they work, right? They we we know they work. There there are thousands of schools running with lotteries every year uh, in the United States. Um, certainly, I don't know what would happen. I don't know what would happen to the the reading proficiency levels. And I agree, reading proficiency on on the state test is just a proxy for what we're trying to get at, which is is this a place where students thrive, right? Is this a place where students become full human beings who can go out into the wor world and, and, and do well. And, and, you know, a reading proficiency score is a very limited method of doing that. But I would argue that if you're not preparing your kids, if, if the kids aren't reading proficient, then we know they're failing. If they are reading proficient, I don't think that's uh, sufficient, but it's a good sign that, that at least we're meeting a minimum floor. Um, and I think the transportation is important, right? Um, anytime you can provide transportation options and help lower income kids get to better schools, that is valuable. But I also think you don't, it's not a precursor, it's not absolutely necessary in the sense that you'd be surprised at how many families can get their kids to better schools if they're allowed in, right? Like if, if there's a kid in South Central whose mom works up in, it's a, she, he has a single mom and she works up in a wealthy area of LA and that family is paying property taxes either via their rent or their actual property taxes to pay for schools in a wealthier area of Los Angeles Unified. And, they, and, and she, maybe she works right next to this high performing school in an upper income area. Like that will happen and, and you know, you don't you don't want to say no to that. I, although I agree that the, to the, the degree that you can make more transportation options uh, available and subsidize that for lower income families, I think that's valuable to do. And I would urge that. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, a big thank you to all of our panelists. I realize that we could only scratch the surface of this uh, immensely important topic. Uh, big thanks to our attendees as well. Uh, and this will be going up on YouTube on the St. Anselm College channel, and we will send a link to everyone who registered for this event. All right, thank you and good night. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.